All right. So we're going to continue our story this morning about um, paternal care in non-human primates, particularly our closest primate relatives, the great apes. Uh, you can see them nicely lined up there, right? Uh, we talked about chimpanzees, we talked about bonobos, and now we're going to talk about gorillas and then move on to talk about orangutans. These are all the great apes, as they're called. And remember our task was, well, if we show paternal care, this species here, right, why don't we look to those that are closely related? Maybe they also show paternal care. And so far, have we seen a lot of paternal care in chimpanzees or bonobos? No, not very much, right? So let's turn to our, the next guy on the list, the next species on the list, and that's gorillas. Um, this is a picture of, yeah, thanks, of mountain gorillas. Uh, that is, I think that's Pablo. Uh, I think I that's think, Titus. That is not Titus. There's no way that's Titus. But he's got the brown spot there. That's that definitely is not Titus. Titus. No, okay, I we're think disagreeing. That's Pablo. Yeah. I anyway, think, well, I think, I think yeah. it's Titus. Okay. Titus with his family. Okay. What a spectacular guy. We love Titus. Aptly named, right? Roman general. No, he. Um, we love Titus. Gorillas are cool, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, gorillas you know, like, are cool. Well, maybe. Well, yeah. this is a typical family scene for a gorilla. You, you see there a big silverback male and several females and their infants, and they're all huddled together. They're in a siesta right now. This is the middle of the day after they fed, and they're kind of resting. Uh, and so their life is really, they, they, their, their daily routine is to go find food. Uh, they eat only vegetation, and then they rest, and then they have to go find food again. And often a group looks like this, one silverback with several females, and they're young. Here's another portrait. There's a, a silverback and a female. Now that definitely is Titus. Yeah, that's for sure Titus. <laughs> Same guy. <laughs> it's, okay. Um, and so this male is surrounded by his females and they're young. Now, as we said with the other primates that we were talking about, you usually have what his daughters or his sons are going to leave their natal group. This is a way of, of avoiding inbreeding. In some species, both of them leave their natal group. Uh, and sometimes they might even stay. You know, like one, it's kind of a, a mixture of things that are happening. Yeah, and uh, it, unlike in chimpanzees and gorillas, the uh, males, the silverbacks, form bonds. They form very close relationships to particular females. Uh, and so uh, that can sometimes uh, be an incentive for a daughter uh, that is related to, obviously, you know, to the daughter of one of these females that a silverback is bonded to. Uh, she might want to stay because, you know, she could enjoy some of the benefits of that close relationship that mom has to the silverback. Now, she'll only stay, a daughter will only stay if there's more than one silverback in the group because generally they don't mate with their dads, right? That's a little creepy, but that's also something that happens in nature. There's a lot of inbreeding avoidance mechanisms in nature, too. So, um, so if there's one silverback in the group, and oftentimes it is just one silverback, then when the daughter grows up and she wants and she's starting to cycle, then she'll often leave the group and join another group with a new silverback. And so males then have sometimes an option of staying or going. You might have a young son grow up in the group, and he might go off and want to start his own group. In fact, you might have several males go off, and they form like a little bachelor group. You know, they eat pizza and drink beer and hang out and watch TV for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they go out, essentially, and want to steal females from other groups. Okay? But, it's, but it's a tough life mm -hmm. if, uh, if you're a male in that position, uh, sexually mature, because you have to sort of reckon what your chances are of becoming the dominant male if you stay in the group as a mature male, a second, or maybe there's already a, a third one. 
I, as Manitzin was saying, sometimes these guerrilla groups have several silverback males in them, and so your decision to stay or go, you know, is sort of a kind of um, reckoning process of, are my chances pretty good of, of becoming top dog or rising in the hierarchy here so uh, that I might get some meetings with females, or do I leave and form my own group, which is also tough, because then you have to steal females usually from somebody else's group, and uh, that's a tough job. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, because it helps us understand why these guys are so big, the males. So another picture I wanted to draw your attention to is this one down here, because we want to also ask, well, given what we know about gorillas, do they live in a family then? Hmm. Well, as it turns out, this is a picture of a big, huge silverback named Cansby. He's in his prime here. They're called silverbacks because when they mature, they get this silver saddle right there. That's how you know it's an adult male. Okay, uh, And he grew up in that group. He uh, was born in this group, and he stayed in this group and became one of the leading males. You know, At this point, he wasn't a, the, dom the number one male, but he was one of the leading males. And this female right here, she's got a tiny little brand new baby. This is, I think, her sixth baby. And she's looking at Cansby kind of with pride because that is her first baby. So Cansby stayed in his natal group, decided to try to stay in the group and try to just mate with females within the group. And this is his mom that's in that natal group. So given that, do you think that gorillas at any point form families? Right? That would satisfy our definition of a family, a long-term tie with a mother or a father and their offspring into adulthood. And so they, they still see each other, right? He comes home to Easter. <laughs> He's home already. <laughs> so the life of, of these animals, if you think about it, if you're one of these silverbacks, <clears throat> you are surrounded by males outside that are always trying to sneak in and steal females. Right? That's kind of uh, the lifestyle of these animals. So that, that is going to help us explain, sorry, that's going to help us explain something that's very dramatic in mountain gorillas and in all gorillas. And yeah, that is... You can see that males are hugely larger than the females, not quite twice the size or body weight, pretty but sometimes close. they get pretty close to it. Mm -hmm. And they also have massively larger canine teeth. You know, these teeth in the corner of your jaw uh, that are used in, when they're big, uh, they're not so big in us, right? Your canine teeth don't project beyond the rest of the teeth. But in many mammals and males, uh, they're often much bigger in the sense that they project beyond, you know, sort of vampire-like, you might say, uh, beyond the other teeth, <clears throat> and then they become fighting uh, uh, weapons, right? They're, they're, it's, it's part of their weaponry for fighting, and of course, if you look at a gorilla, he's got massive jaws, heavily muscled jaws uh, that attach to a big bony crest on top of the skull that nicely anchors those massive muscles because if you're going to bite and rip, use those jaws and use those teeth for fighting, you have to have a massive head that has massive uh, muscle attachments on it. And so there, when you look at these gorillas, these male gorillas in this case, they're fighting machines. There's no question. Their body size, that's not blubber. That's not couch potato mm -hmm. fat. This is pure muscle, you know. You could take any sort of world champion. Oh, we did. Remember? The strongest man in the world. He contacted us and he said, well, how, how much, you know, do you think that I could go up against a gorilla? Who would win if we had to do a, a what do you call it, a clean and press <laughs> between a gorilla and, a, uh, and, and this strong man? Yeah. 
And no uh, they, contest. There was, it was amazing. I mean, they figured it out. I can't remember what the, the, we had to contact some physiologists and stuff to figure it out. Anyway, this guy, the strongest man in the world, he became a big, huge gorilla fan and started supporting gorillas in the wild because he, he wanted to know how strong they were. Yeah. No They're contest. extremely strong. Extremely yeah. strong. Uh, and, um, and there's a reason for this, right? This is what we're talking about here, this sort of massive strength this massive size, this fighting equipment, uh, is the consequence of sexual selection. And let me just point out that, you know, they have this big size and they have these big giant teeth. And let me remind you, they eat salad all day long, okay? They don't need giant teeth to, to munch on celery. See, that's, right? <laughs> that's kind of a good message for those of you that are vegetarian. If you're thinking, can I get big just on vegetables? Sort of. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to have a very large gut to do that. Okay. These guys eat, you know, those big, um, those big giant trash bags, those black big giant trash bags that you put leaves in and stuff. If you fill that up with salad, that's how much a gorilla eats a day. So About you'd have to do that. Pounds. About yeah. 60 pounds of vegetation. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. There's also a lot of gas in uh, well, that. that. So that I was tends just going to gonna say, you know. To, just to have to take that into account if you're going to a lot of gas. Yeah. If you're going to go yeah. down that road, yeah. uh, so we know that then this body size difference, this massive size of the males and their canines, are examples of that what we talked about before, sexual selection. Right? It's something that's different between males and females. Females don't have these big daggers. Females aren't this giant size. Ah, that's already a clue. There's sexual selection going on. And sexual selection has to do with what? Why, why should one of the two sexes be bigger or have a different morphology and different traits? Yeah, remember the sort of two components or two forces of sexual how, selection? How does it help them? What, There's two things what that, the two, two ways it can two, help them. Two remember forces that? of sexual selection. What are two, two ways? ways? Yes. Which, Right, Ma competition mating, mating is one, competition. mating That's competition, right. and what's the other way that uh, a trait, think of the peacock. Yeah, what else, what was the second? Mating yes. competition? Thank yeah. you, mate choice. mate choice, thank you, so females good like, job. Like the trait, and uh, so that gets accentuated. Yeah, exactly right, so those are the two. So in gorillas, uh, we have the same thing happening, and uh, <clears throat> certainly... Uh, in this case, we know that the, um, I think it's the second highest cause of mortality, is it, or is it the first? It depends It's on first or what, second, yeah. yeah. Highest cause of mortality is uh, uh, infanticide, uh, killing of infants, and of course it's um, male, what we call male-practiced infanticide. It's, it's usually a male from outside the group that will try to take over the group, defeat the resident dominant silverback, and then the next thing he does is kill infants that are still lactate, that are still taking suckling. breast milk, that are still suckling. The idea behind this is that it brings the mother, if they kill the infant, the mother starts cycling again, and so then that new male can start mating with the mom, creating his own babies, okay? Kind of a cruel thing, you might say, but that's how nature sometimes works. And it turns out infanticide like this, male practiced infanticide, is a mating strategy that you see amongst many mammals. It's not just in gorillas that they're odd this way. But given that that's uh, a huge cause of mortality, right, you can imagine that there would have been a lot of evolutionary pressure to protect as much as possible against the threat of infanticide. And that's what these big males do. They get large. Uh, females seem to like larger males. We have some evidence for this, some direct evidence. They seem to like males that have the big heads, big jaws, and so on. And so males are the protectors of the group. And they get big like this. They become fighters because over evolutionary time, females have preferred males that can be good protectors, that are big like this, they're good fighters. Uh, and, uh, and of course, they also, this is, you know, they prevail 
uh, if likely to prevail if they're attacked by another male. So that's, this. you got that sexual selection because there's male-male competition. These, these males are going to protect their family at all costs. They go all out. Part of it is a lot of display. So did you ever wonder where this chest beating that Tarzan does, where that comes from? You ever see Tarzan? Oh, is that right? No. It comes from gorillas. They do this chest beat display and chimps, they have... But chimps don't do that. So, no. so Edgar Rice Burroughs was, was a bit off there, That's right? Because right. Tarzan was raised by chimps and chimps uh, don't chest beat. Although in the Disney version, I think it's gorillas. In the Disney version, they were gorillas. You're right. That's they right. changed so it. Yeah, they actually they got a little they, more realistic. They did it right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the chest beating is part of that display to scare off uh, to an, uh, an opponent. It also, those pops of the chest beat, you could hear them for a long distance. So even a s solitary bachelor male that's far away, he can hear the pop, pop, pop of chest beating and know that there's a, there's a silverback over there. I may, be, I may need to avoid that. Yeah, that's right. So this is telling us that this very large body size, it is a result of sexual selection, and it's because of mating competition these males are in competition, not with males within the group, like we saw in chimps, right? That was really the driver of large testes size. This is male, male competition outside the group, males that are external to the group. And you can see in this graph, when we look at between group or external male competition and how dimorphic animals are, that's what this graph is showing. We have gorillas, and we have chimpanzees, and we have humans here, and this is a ratio of the body size of males to females, and if, if they were the same size, if male size equals female size, then it would be right here, 100%. Anything above that means that males are bigger. Anything below that means that males are smaller. Well, what we see here is that, well, humans, there's, you know, Males are a tiny bit bigger than females, you know, like this. Peter's a little bit bigger than I am, right? But is he twice as big as I am? No. So that's where we see gorillas are at that, you know, twice as big as females. Um, so huge body dimorphism, and that is a signal of there's a lot of male-male competition outside the group, especially. Well, it can be inside the group, too. We see a little bit in chimpanzees. Uh, but it's a really big driver externally. Right, and that male competition, as we were just saying, just to be clear, is to keep other males from invading the group, from taking over your group, or just stealing your females. Because remember, mm -hmm. there are these bachelor males out there, and they're trying to get your females. And so you need to protect them and guard them, right? So that's where that... And often when you see these uh, encounters between either bachelor males and these resident male groups, uh, or you see two groups uh, that encounter each other, males will actually fight each other, and they oh, get yeah. injured. And sometimes they die from those injuries because they can be really tough injuries, you know, big rips and shreds and, you know, uh, gashes, and they can catch nasty infections, and, and they'll die. And that's one reason, actually, why male gorillas don't live nearly as long as female gorillas do because they sort of poop out from all the fighting they they have to do. So this is real. We, we, we have observed this countless it's times. Scary. It's scary to be around when two males are uh, even thinking about fighting. It's very scary. Uh, so when we look then, again, this is another chart just showing that when you look at bo male body size to female size, if they were the same size, you get a ratio of one, right? So this down here would be the same body size. And you can see that in monogamous primates, uh, it's maybe a little bit different for them one. Males are a little bit bigger, okay. In one male groups, where you have a group and it's one male and several females, look at this. There's a huge difference. Males are much, much bigger. That has to do with that external competition. If one male has a harem of females, that means there's a lot of guys out there that don't have a male, that don't have a female, right? If generally, when you give birth, when a female gives birth, usually it's the same number of sons as daughters, right? But if you think about that, if that's true, then if one male hogs a bunch of females, right, has a bunch of females in his harem, then there's going to be some males out there that have no females. 
So that's going to be a lot of competition from those males, from those bachelors that want to mate. How are they going to get females? They have to fight a resident male. So that's why you get this intense external competition in species that live in one male polygyny. That's a harem. One male, many females. Right? So both within group competition among males for mating partners and between group competition, as we've just des described for gorillas, both of those kinds of mating competition can result in sexual dimorphism, in driving this larger male body size and often associated canine size with that. Yeah, so chimps, they have a lot of internal competition. That certainly drives their testy size. It also drives a little bit of their body size, yeah, too. Chimps, They're a little bit bigger than females. Bigger. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. why you see here, this is the bar for multi-male, multi-female groups. Okay? But for single male groups, these harem groups, it's just mm -hmm. a huge driver. Yeah, and so male, you really male, see it. Yeah, okay? that's right. Male chimp canines are bigger, too, than Yeah, females. they're fighters, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So here's that graph that you'll see over and over again. So for gorillas, they don't live in this kind of social mating system. They live in this mating system. One male, several females, and their offspring. And here's another group. One male, several females, and their offspring. And then what we should add are these little lone males floating around trying to steal females. Or this male attacking. These males may come into conflict with each other because they're trying to steal each other's females. I'll tell you, that's, it's a real thing. We have that guy, Cansby, that I was telling you about. His mom was looking at him. He was all proud. He was showing off. He was standing sideways. He was showing off to show how big he was. The females loved this guy. Five females from a neighboring group left to join him. That's a lot. I think in that one year, he gained like 12 females. They were flocking to him like, like what? Flies to honey. <laughs> sure. To no. honey. Yeah, you know, he, there you go. He was on the cover of People magazine that year, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, no Kansas kidding. Yeah. So it makes a difference. So here we have sexual selection, mating competition, and female attraction to those kinds of traits, both of them happening at the same time. It's really driving that sexual dimorphism. So let's take a look at our, our gorilla friends here. We need to understand gorillas. I told you we kind of described this before, this picture where it shows the size of a male and then the relative size of their testes. And remember we talked about our we talked at length about our chimpanzee friends with their very large testy size. Now look at the gorilla. He's big. He's bigger than even chimpanzees. He's a big guy. Look at he's got itty bitty bitty testes. All right? Itty bitty little testes. Small testes. All right, all right. Okay. <laughs> to the and point of embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I'll tell you a story. Do you know why that gorilla that I was showing you his name was Cansby? What a weird name, right? Diane Fossey named him Cansby. The reason was is that uh, when Tuck was young and had her first baby, a tracker came running to camp and said, Diane Fossey, quick, Tuck gave birth. And she said, Tuck? Tuck is a male. It can't be. And so that's how he got the word Cansby. She was confused. She didn't know. You can't tell easily what's a male and what's a female because you don't see any testes. And so she, when she started her studies, she thought Tuck was a male. And then Tuck had a baby. And so she said, can't be. It can't be, right? And that was the name of the first baby for, for Tuck. Can't be. He's that very handsome guy that attracts a bunch of females. Right. So, so um, keep in mind here now what we're saying is Itty that... Bitty testy. Okay. <laughs> we get it. <laughs> what we're saying is that... Itty bitty testy. Okay. What we're saying is that... Uh, it's within group competition that drives sperm competition and hence the large testicular size, okay? Because you clearly have between group competition here, but it's within group competition when, and the reason, and it should make sense to you, right? Because it's only when you have a bunch of other males that are sort of living with you in a group, as it were, 
that when females come into heat or into the you know into estrus as we say when they're ready to mate that then it sets up a lot of competition amongst these males these several males in these groups uh, as we've described it for chimps to then mate with that female and that's what drives sperm competition that's what leads to uh, this enlargement of testes way beyond what you'd expect for an animal of the same of that body size now, but between competition, between group competition is what's driving this body size. It could be within or between, but especially between group competition. Mm -hmm. So, now we're telling you all this because we have to tie this back to paternal care, right? We're trying to figure out, well, should gorillas show any kind of paternal care? And, and we that remember in turn, we, yeah. we, we, we started out by saying, well, remember, one of the first things that is going to um, drive any male to show any kind of care for the youngsters is paternity confidence. So tell me, given what we know about gorillas, now you're an expert on gorillas, okay? Do you think that Cansby or Titus or any of these silverbacks, do you think he has high paternity confidence or low paternity confidence? What's your thinking? How many say hi? Hi. How many say okay. low? A couple. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we're getting you to think. So tell me, why do you think it's high confidence? Who wants to offer an, an idea? Were oh, you just stretching? She had her hand. <laughs> oh, you're only scratching. Okay. Who wants, who suggests? Yeah. Very nice. He said, it's one male, usually one male, multi-female, so he knows those are his babies, right? Mm -hmm. So very high male paternity confidence. And so, yeah, in fact, yeah. Um, even when there are historical circumstances when you have more than one silverback in a group, we know from DNA tests that you know we've done over the years that the dominant, the alpha, as it were, the most dominant, the leading silverback male fathers the vast majority of offspring. Right. He okay. really is in command. He is master and commander of his group, even if there's lieutenant males, so to speak. You know, so that's a good kind of strategy is to hang out if you're a male, be at least second in command, uh, and maybe steal away a female one day. But mm -hmm. it's, a good, it's another good strategy. So yes, they have high paternity confidence. We know that from the DNA evidence that a dominant silverback, those are likely his babies. So what would you predict about any kind of paternal care? Should we see any paternal care in gorillas? Yeah, right? That's what we should see. If these are his babies, he should show care for them. So let's take a look and see. Well, the first thing is, we already talked about a major form of paternal care that these silverbacks perform. Protection. Isn't that indirect care? That's a form of indirect care. Does he spend a lot of effort doing that? You bet. And uh, it makes sense that he should because of what we've just said, namely he knows that most of the kids in that group are his kids. So putting his life on the line defending that group, defending the moms and the kids in that group is well worth it because they all have his genes. Most, the vast majority of them do. So they will survive even if it, even if you don't, in other words. So yes, there's a lot of effort, a lot of energy invested in protecting. Uh, if those weren't your kids, if you weren't sure that those were your kids, eh, you might be less willing to risk at all uh, to protect them. But in this case, he's pretty sure they're his. So. That's why they're really great protectors. I mean, obviously they're not consciously aware of no. these things, but through evolution, this is, drives males to be super, they're excellent protectors of their babies and their group and their females. In fact, uh, one guy, uh, Dieter's, one of Dieter's favorite buddies was the Titus guy. He would go on patrol. He wouldn't even just protect his group right here. He would make sure, and there was, make sure there was no males in the vicinity he would go out on patrol and make sure no males even got anywhere near his group. I used to go on patrol with him. And he used was, to go patrolling with him. Yeah, right. he would let me do that. He would sort of 
I'd sort of trot along behind him as he was making this huge loop around his group, because up on the hills and over the mountains, and, and he would look back at me like, what are you doing trailing behind me? But he'd let me follow him along yeah. as we'd go. It was such a cool thing. Very cool. He'd turn yeah. around and go, shh, yeah. be quiet. <laughs> be quiet. <laughs> Don't make any noise. Yeah, very neat. So definitely indirect care. What about direct care? Well, this is something near and dear to our hearts because this is one of our research areas. This is a silverback playing with a young whippersnapper. Kind of think of him as a teenager. They are wrestling, and they do this a lot. Silverbacks, remember, are huge. They have to eat a lot of food, and they have to rest to digest that food. But he spends energy playing roughhousing with kids. And he might roughhouse even, even with a little baby like this. This is hilarious. If you see a silverback that's this big playing with a little, his hand is as big as that baby, all right? And what he'll literally do is he'll just sit there sleeping kind of and do this, and his hand is like wrestling <laughs> this baby while he's trying to sleep, you know? <laughs> uh, we'll show you some, some video of that, that that we've taken over the years uh, when we get to that segment of the course where we talk about development and play. Yeah. It's pretty cool stuff. So this is another form. This is direct care, right? We would call this direct care. He's, and it would be part of this social and moral training. Why is it social and moral training? Well, as we'll, we'll have a whole lecture about the importance of play, but play is really important for learning social rules, learning when you're going a little too far, also learning just physical coordination. So this playing in rough, this, this rough housing way, this what's called rough and tumble play, is actually training, both socially and physically. So here's, we have evidence that, yep, they also play with their babies. And some males are just super sweet. I mean, there's one male that he just loved just cuddling with the babies. He was just so amazing. He was awesome. Um, in fact, one student loved him so much that he tattooed a picture of him, Isa Bukuru, mm -hmm. on his arm <laughs> after he went with us to the field to see him. <laughs> anyway, so back to our chart here. We're tracking, right, the different species. So would we say that for gorillas, is there any direct care? Right? We have an example of direct care. The, he plays with his offspring. What about indirect care? Right? He's doing that. He's protecting the group. So overall, would you put them at super high paternal care or super low paternal care? Where would you put gorillas? Where do you think? Yeah, maybe on the middle to high range. Do they do as much care as humans, do you think? Not. Yeah. So a little bit less. Maybe a little right? bit less yeah. than that. So kind so of on kind the, in the middle, maybe. Kind of in the middle yeah. or on the high end, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. So yeah. now we can also put them on this chart, right? What about those what animals that live in a family group and show paternal care? Do gorillas get in that sweet spot like humans? Do they live in a family? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do they show paternal care? Yes. Gorillas are in that sweet spot. Okay? And here we then show that, yes, they show direct care. Um, the question mark is because we haven't measured whether that playing has actual fitness benefits. We're working on that. But that's why, you know, we're not trying to bias this, but we, we haven't shown that. So we'll, we'll put a little question mark there. Certainly indirect care. They do protect their babies. Okay, so last one on the list. We've looked at chimps, not so much paternal care. Gorillas. They show paternal care. What about orangutans? Well, th this, of course, is the Asian great ape, right? That's the only place uh, they're found. <clears throat> uh, principally, well, entirely uh, on the islands of Borneo and uh, Sumatra. And again, look at these uh, size differences between males and females. Males, again, uh, virtually, well, I think they are twice the size of females. You can see in that bottom picture, they have these um, flanges, as they're called, fleshy kinds of uh, enlargements of the cheeks and um, forehead, right, uh, that uh, they get uh, 
when they become sexually mature under the influence of the male hormone testosterone. And look at that, big, big canine teeth, of course, as well. All of that anatomy there, the big size, that big kind of enhancement of the head and the, the canines. Oh, wait, and don't forget this one. That's to they make have these air yeah. sacs. Well, that's right, but I uh, just wanted to say, I mean, the idea here, if you say, well, why do they have these big fleshy flanges, is because it makes the head look bigger, right? So this is t so as to, for the male, to as to make himself look more threatening, bigger than he actually is. And that's already telling you something about that this might be an aspect of uh, between male competition, right? And yeah, like, like you say, uh, they also have specialized air sacs because they give loud calls that travel a long distance through the forest so that they tell other males, hey, don't come this way because this is my territory, right? So just briefly with orangutans, <clears throat> um, the males don't live with females year round. They only visit females when the females are sexually receptive. Uh, and so what the male does, he sort of carves out, so to speak, a territory, a very large territory that he patrols that may have several females, adult females, in that territory. But the female essentially lives by herself <clears throat> with her offspring, um, and they're highly arboreal. Um, females rarely come to the ground. They mostly spend their time up in the trees because they're really specialized frugivores. In other words, they eat hardly anything except fruit, some leafy material too. Uh, so there's no need for them to drop down and uh, come to the ground. The males, on the other hand, do drop down to the ground because they can move more quickly on the ground when they're, you know, it's, they're big guys. And imagine, you know, swinging Tarzan-like uh, almost, um, to patrol a big area like that would be energetically far too costly for them. So they drop down to the ground, they patrol this big area on, on, the, on the ground, basically. They so that's how they... Them. In trees, up and down, yeah, they are just they go patrolling up and down, but, constantly. But that's, right? their, that's what they mostly do. So this here again is another story of sexual selection, right? All that that you learned about, you're seeing it in action here. Do the females have these big flange faces? No, we only see it in males. These males are much bigger than females. Again, indicator that this is sexually selected. And could it be sexually selected then for two purposes, right? Could it be for male-male competition or female choice? Is there, is there much with in-group male competition here? Not really, right? Because they don't live in groups. So most of this all of this competition between males, similar to what you see in the gorillas in that regard, is between males, right? External, as it were, right? Because they don't really live in groups. So it's, you know, one male, if he can keep other males away from those females that are in his territory, uh, then he gets mating privileges with those females. Mm -hmm. So it's well worth his time uh, to defend those females. But, you know, he doesn't live with them. He doesn't stay with them. So he's sort of moving around all the time, making sure that there aren't other males uh, coming in to mate with those females. That's, co that's a constant problem for an adult male gorilla, uh, sorry, an adult male orangutan, not for a gorilla, because a gorilla has his group, and he keeps them sort of, you know, close to himself, so he's kinda, he kind of knows where his females are the whole time. Orangs, not so much. They're out there patrolling. So given what you know about then orangutans, we'll, we'll get to this in a minute here, but mm -hmm. given what you know about orangutans so far, uh, what would you predict about their testy size? Itty bitty or big? Big. What? He's going for big. Anybody going for itty bitty? What do you think? Who what says, think? who says... Ah, well, sorry, I didn't so quite get you're that thinking, one. well, if you're very big, what is that big size telling you? It's telling you there's male-male there's male competition going on. Is there male-male competition within the group or outside the group? Is it males that are outside that's the problem? Right, because there's no males. That he doesn't even live in a group. 
So you don't have internal group no. competition, so you don't need really big testy sides, right? And sperm competition isn't going to help you because there are likely not going to be multiple males mating at the, you know, around the same time right. that one, when one female is in heat or in estrus, right? Because yeah. remember, that's what drives the possibility of multiple matings during that female cycle. That's what drives sperm competition. That's what drives large testicular size. You don't have that in gorillas. You don't have that in orangs. You do have a lot of that in chimps, as we've said. Right. So we said, okay, what do we know? They have big size. It's just kind of like the, a little bit like the gorilla story. You've got big size, big canines, big vocal tracts to tell everyone, get away. These are my girls, right? Lots of competition outside the group. That's what's driving that dimorphism, that sexual selection for those traits. It's a lot of external male-male competition. So the biology beautifully fits, just as evolutionary theory predicts here, beautifully predicts... <laughs> okay. okay. This is crazy. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. The, <laughs> the theory beautifully predicts the biology in this case. And the biology being the testicular size, being the body size, all of this stuff we we're just talking about, right? So you can see here, orangs uh, have small testicular uh, sizes, okay. kind of like gorillas in that regard. Okay. Yeah. And it fits, their, it fits right. the behavior, it fits their natural history just so, beautifully. So now I want to ask you, what do you think about paternity confidence. Do you think that orangutans have high or low paternity confidence? High? They're patrolling this area. You think high? Anyone think low? Might think that it's high, but we haven't finished telling you the story of the world of orangutans. And I want to go back to this picture. Because here you have, at the top there's a male and a female orangutan, right? And at the bottom there's a big giant male. Big male. You know what's surprising? This guy. This guy's also a male. Kind of looks like a female, right? These guys are adult males. They're called Peter Pan males. Peter Pan males. Why Peter Pan males? There we go. <laughs> Remember Peter Pan? It's because they wear those green spandex pants? Is that why? Yes, that's the orangutans are wearing spandex pants. That's no. it. <laughs> because they're wearing silly hats. Well, like Peter Pan, he said, I never want to grow up. And then, you know, that's, that's kind of, uh, so uh, I think that's why they're in that sense at least kind of aptly named because they've decided, so to speak, not to grow up, to, to delay. Eventually they do grow up. Eventually they do grow into one of those fearsome big uh, mm -hmm. male rank. They do. Mm -hmm. They do. It's just that they delay, delay this because it's a reproductive strategy. They are what is known in the animal behavior world, sneak copulators, right? So they're basically trying to pretend that they're no threat to whatever this big uh, adult male is that might be in the vicinity. They're basically saying, look, I'm just a little guy here. You know, I, I, I'm... Or even from a distance, or I'm a I female. look like a female. Yeah. I'm not right. quite sure, even Peter Pan, you're not quite sure. Is he male And the or females female? are often not sure. So you got this little guy approaching a female, and suddenly he mates with her, right? We've, that, that is to say, uh, naturalists, you know, people that study these guys, have actually seen these Peter Pan males mate with adult females. Sometimes, in fact, they force themselves they forcefully copulate, as we say, with these adult females because they don't particularly want to do this, you know. But uh, they're 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 a bit stronger than um, than the adult females, so they, that they can over overwhelm an adult female who's in heat. So they get in there. So that tends to sort of ruin uh, this big adult male's paternity confidence, or at least it lowers it a bit, right? Because right. these guys sneak in there and copulate with females. And then remember, this also the traveling salesman's problem in another way, which is that this guy, the big guy, right, he's moving around. He's out of town a lot, <laughs> right? Because he's, he's trying to patrol this whole territory that might have three or four or five females in it. 
And so he's sort of moving around trying to exclude other males. While he's busy out there doing that or visiting a female that's on the far end who's in estrus, right, another one in another part of his territory might be mating with one of these a guys. A little Peter Pan guy can exactly. sneak in, right? Yeah, the Peter Pan males, they don't announce themselves. It's not like they have those big boat. They're not announcing that they're around. They are sneaky, and that's their strategy: is to sneak in and copulate. So, so what happens? So, like Dieter said, what happens to their paternity conf to the paternity confidence of these males? It's not so high as we thought, right? It's not so sure whether there whether one of the females has a baby. The male is not so sure who's the father. So, if you have low paternity confidence. Do you think, what do you think about showing paternal care? What well, would you gonna, predict? What are you going to predict? High, high, high paternal, paternal care, care? Or low paternal care? Who votes for high paternity care? Nobody, anybody vote for low paternity care or no paternity care? Quite That's a few of right. you do. That's right, yeah, exactly. So let's take a look. It's a quick answer. There's no paternal care. They do absolutely nothing with the babies. It's all up to mom. Mom raises these youngsters for eight years on her own. This is single mothering completely. And the males do nothing. Uh, so uh, so now, we would say that there's no paternal care in this species. Now she only has one offspring at a time, which is a good thing. You know, a twinning is rare in these guys. And so, you know, it'd be hard for her to it'd be, twins. It would be, it'd be really impossible. tough because yeah. she has this unusually long dependency, as Netzin was saying, eight years, one of the longest mm -hmm. lactation times uh, for any of these primate females. Mm -hmm. it's, it's much longer than certainly than, than what humans do, mm -hmm. or any of the other apes in this case. So it's a big energetic drain, but she's, she manages, apparently. They've mm -hmm. survived, right? Mm -hmm. So even though primatologists have studied orangs uh, for uh, you know, 30 some years, done field observations on Sumatra, on Borneo, never one instance of male care observed. So on our little chart, we'd put them not even on the low end, they'd be like off the chart. There's no paternal care there at all, okay? And on this chart, uh, they, they don't even live in families because once the female, once her daughter or son is mature, they, they might hang around nearby for a little while, but eventually they all disperse to go to another territory. So there generally isn't a long-term relationship between even the mom and the offspring, and certainly not the dad and the offspring. So we put them not, not in a family, not showing paternal care, and no um, paternal care at all. This is where they are. So this is to summarize. These are all the great apes. These are all our closest living relatives. And you can see they're all over the place, right? They don't all live in this sweet spot where humans are. You have some, like chimps and gorillas, that are in this sweet spot, live in families and show paternal care. And they have a variety of levels of paternal care. Chimps, a little bit maybe. Gorillas, more, certainly. Um, bonobos don't show any paternal care, but they live in families. And orangutans are just out of it completely. So the whole the idea is that despite the fact that they are phylogenetically close relatives of ours, that they share many of our genes, that doesn't mean they behave exactly as we do. Okay? Mm -hmm. It depends on the challenges that they face. That's what natural selection and sexual selection is all about. You adapt to the environmental challenges. So you may have many of the same genes, but how you deploy them could be very different. Yeah, okay. so that's the big conclusion by comparing ourselves to our closest relatives, the great apes, include the African apes and the Asian ape in this case, right? Uh, the big conclusion is that genetic relatedness or degree of genetic relatedness between us and them is no good predictor at all of them showing any paternal care, right? But instead, what we've learned also as our second conclusion here is that these theoretical uh, predictions that followed from Robert Trivers' uh, uh, parental investment theory, right, which is that the minimal conditions of paternity certainty or confidence uh, and it making a difference uh, in, the, uh, in the offspring's uh, uh, fitness, right, in the offspring's survival and reproduction, as it were, that it translates 
into the father's fitness because your offspring do better. Those two propositions, right, have held up really strong here. Well, so, the first one, the paternity competence. Right, okay, we yeah. Uh, but we can now test this out a little bit more um, by go going a slightly Wait. different direction and saying, well, let's look at where we uh, might find... Can, like, can we finish up here for a second? I know you're jumping ahead, so I'm just telling you. Can you hold on one second? Okay, <laughs> I'll pull it back. I'll pull rein it, back. it in. Okay. I'm getting fast. too excited yeah, by know, this material. Because yeah. it's cool. It's cool stuff. So we just wanted to show you this. If we looked at our phylogenetic tree, these are all the primates, right? We are that homo, homo sapiens right on the far right. That's our little family tree that we just investigated. This little family tree is what we just investigated. What's shown in blue are those species where there is good evidence that there is direct paternal care. Right? And as you can see, it has nothing to do with phylogenetic relationship, our genetic connectedness. It, otherwise, you would have a lot of blue over here. But we have you know, very dispersed instances of where you have paternal care, okay? So right away, we know, as Dieter said, our conclusions so far are that despite the fact that we are, I looked it up, 99.72% similar to chimpanzees, yet our behavior is not just like chimpanzees, right? Uh, so the phylogeny, the degree of evolutionary genetic relatedness, does not predict paternal care. That is not what's going to tell us about males and how they behave. That's not sufficient. One necessary condition that we've seen that, that came from Trivers, right, was that paternity confidence has to be fairly high, at least reasonably good, for males to even invest it all. We know that that's at least one condition. You're not going to see any males investing if there's no paternity confidence, okay? So, when we think about the necessary conditions for paternal care, our story is starting to unfold. The first condition is paternity confidence. Okay, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about two more, but that is certainly one. Now, <coughs> this is where Dieter was excited to go to next. If paternity confidence is so important, and if that's really what's gonna drive males to invest in offspring, because they know it's their babies, right? Then here's an idea. Let's look at monogamous species, right? In monogamy, paternity confidence is pretty high, right? It's one male, one female. They mate, they have babies. Paternity confidence is pretty high, probably really high. So... Yeah, because monogamous species stay around each mm -hmm. other all year long. Mm -hmm. It's a permanent, bond, more or less right. permanent, unless one yeah. of them dies, of course. It's yeah. more or less a permanent bond. So can we conclude that all monogamous species show paternal care? Hmm, you're saying no. That's interesting. What's your thinking? I don't know, the father can be confident that it's his child, but for a variety of circumstances, just might not be able to or willing to care for the child. Nice. You're thinking about, but you're thinking yeah. about human societies right. now. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. but that's well, okay, that can apply. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so her point was that, okay, so monogamy, you might have high paternity confidence, but, and so you would think there'd be paternal care, but you're saying, you know, I feel like there's, these other factors that also might determine whether they invest in the offspring. Yeah, I think that's what you're saying. That's right. Yeah. Monogamy and that high paternity confidence that comes with it generally may not be sufficient. So let's see. That's, that's a possibility. Yeah. You know, if we just so, so let's take a look at so some. So it might be necessary, species. but maybe not sufficient. Yeah. yeah. So here's another primate species. These are siamangs. and uh, they are a monogamous species. There's a male and a female almost the same size. It's hard to distinguish them, right? That's true often of monogamous species. There's low, low mating competition, right? It's just one and one. Uh, they Often they have the same size, right? They're not dimorphic, they're monomorphic, the same size. And there's a little baby. And so at about one year of age, these mothers become kind of intolerant of their infants, and the fathers assume most of the care, especially carrying them 
males do almost all the carrying of the baby. Yeah, these are these kids are uh, born uh, pretty good, pretty good size, pretty large relative to the maternal size, body size. So uh, it kind of makes sense, as we'll show you. Yeah, that males might engage in carrying. So do we see paternal care? Absolutely. We see a lot of direct care. He's carrying the infant. Okay, so far so good. They're monogamous, high paternity confidence, and he's doing a lot of paternal care. Let's look at another one. I love these guys. These are TT monkeys. They're so sweet. They're always huddled together. Twining and then, their tails. Their little tails are Signs of affection. Yeah. And they get depressed when you separate them. Yeah. They don't like yeah. it. They really are monogamously bonded. And guess what? These dads uh, care for these babies. They carry them. They feed them. They play with them. They do all this stuff with these babies. And in fact, if you were to take one, a baby, let's say you had a pair with a baby, and you take the baby out of the enclosure just for a minute, of course they get very upset, right? And you put them back in the enclosure where does the baby run to first, mom or dad? They run to dad first. Can you believe that? They are just its like best buds. Even though they go to mom for nursing, they, st they still have to get, they, mom is still nursing them, but everything else, dad is taking care of. So is there a lot of paternal care here? Oh, yeah. Monogamous species, high paternity confidence, high care, amounts of care. Let's look at another one. Again, this is a monogamous species. These are owl monkeys in South America. Dad does most of the carrying and the grooming. Uh, so again, it's another case where, okay, there's high paternity confidence. And fathers are really doing most, if not a huge amount, of the care for the offspring. That's pretty neat, right? But there's always a fly in the ointment, somebody to mess things up. And that's, in this case, the gibbon. You actually have these characters here at the uh, zoo, local zoo, uh, Reed Park Zoo. You can go watch the gibbons, as we've done. And they are, as you can see here, also monogamous. Uh, this is the same species. Yeah. It's interesting, in some species, you have the same size, but they might be two different colors. Mm -hmm. So this is a male and a female gibbon, and they're just two different colors. Interesting. They're be they really are bonded as well. They spend a lot of time together. They wake up in the morning and they duet together. So you might go to the sea here and see. <laughs> yeah. There, it's beautiful to see. So when you go to the Reed Park Zoo, if you could go very early in the morning, then you'll hear the duetting. Don't buy a house near Reed Park Zoo, <laughs> unless you want to get up really early. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing is, though, they are monogamous. But he doesn't do anything with the babies. Not a thing. And, the, what and this is on? a very close relative, genetically speaking, of the siamang, the yeah. one that we just talked about that, you know, a couple of primates ago, that does the, a lot the of the baby carrying. Ones, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. right? Very close relative. No paternal care, yeah. and quite a bit of paternal care in the Siamang. Kind of so interesting. you might be thinking, like, what, what, WTF, right? <laughs> <laughs> why, aren't, why aren't the dads doing anything here, okay? And as it turns out, when you start looking at all the monogamous species, here's a chart that does that. You can see these are monogamous primates. Uh, a lot of them do do male care. This says male care is present. So our owl monkey, our TT monkey, which I love, and uh, other TT monkeys, siamang, so forth, they do paternal care. That's what this is showing. But look over here. Gibbons, eight, spe there are eight different species of gibbons, they show no paternal care. The other weird thing is that, remember those multi-male, multi-female groups? right, like the, the chimpanzees, uh, where you have low paternity confidence, you shouldn't really expect any male care there. We saw some in chimps. We thought that was a little weird. But, but, but look at this. There are a couple where you do see not a huge amount of paternal care, but you see some paternal care. We'll talk about those species a little bit later. So here, so now paternity confidence matters. It certainly explains why a lot of monogamous primates show paternal care.
but there's a lot of multi-male, multi-female, seems like low paternity confidence species, and they're showing paternal care. Again, why? It's because we haven't finished the story about what drives paternal care. It's not just paternity certainty, right. in other words. That is a condition, mm -hmm. but there's the second one. Right? right, remember this slide, this is that same slide. We said there's at least two minimal conditions, at least two. The first one was paternity confidence. Mm -hmm. But now it have the second point here, which is it must also, that is when you invest in your offspring, it might, must have a genetic payoff, a fitness payoff, as we say. It has it to matter. Enhance right? your fitness. And obviously, if you provide good care to your kids, they share your genes, they're going to prosper, they're going to survive better, hopefully, through your care and have their own kids. And so you're, you know, you're making more copies of yourself, uh, kids and grandkids and so on, successive generations. So yeah, that's high fitness value for the dad that's investing in paternal care, right? That's one way, one important way in which paternal care translates into the father's fitness, right? It enhances so the father's fitness. So let's, let's explore that a little bit more. Let's figure out this thing about enhancing father's fitness. So we talked about how in these gibbons, they're monogamous, but they don't show paternal care. So we, we need to see, well, does a father doing anything with the babies, is that going to help the survival or reproduction of those babies? Or is it going to help the mother in any way? That's, those are the kind of questions we need to ask. And so we want to give you some examples to start thinking about how paternal care has to make a fitness difference. It's just a very, very small number of other mammals that live monogamously uh, uh, where we can look to see, and this is a case of the California mouse, very cute little critter, that, uh, that lives monogamously, that's been studied because the males participate in child rearing. Males deliver paternal care, in other words. And so scientists have been able to see whether uh, it makes a difference. When males are there, and you know, of course, unfortunately you can do experiments where you remove the males, right, so they're not there to help, uh, in order to actually see experimentally what difference male care makes, in this case, uh, to a measure of offspring survival, which is the ones that actually emerge from the nest are the ones that have survived, okay? And as you can see here, that the delivery of paternal care compared to the single mom situations really does have a fitness payoff. I mean, those uh, youngsters do in fact survive more uh, so, than the ones that uh, are raised yeah. by single moms. So in this graph, it's the California mice. So of course, if you listen to them and you record their vocalizations, you'll hear, oh my God, would you help me? Um, oh my God, I need you to help me build a nest. I need you to carry my young. Uh, hello? Okay, never mind. Anyway, that was my attempt at California accent. <laughs> uh, so uh, when they're born, this is how many babies are born in the cages, let's say, when there's a pair. And this is how many babies are born when it's just a single mom, right? That's an experimental condition. Okay, there's, it's close to about the same babies that are born. But after, a, after you leave them in the cages, then how many of those babies survive, emerge, like are out and ready to start their own life? Well, the ones that are in pairs, you see there's many more babies that uh, survive um, if, they're, if they grow up in a pair with a male and a female compared to just a single mom. So that shows that having this dad around and the things that he's doing, he's building the nest, he's carrying the young, he's licking the pups, these are all things, this is male direct care. It's making a fitness big difference. Those babies are surviving more when dad's around by doing all those things, okay? So that's what we're looking for. How does it help? How does it enhance his fitness? Remember we talked about the gorilla, the silverback. Do you think this, this care, this being a big fighter, is going to enhance his fitness? Think of think infanticide, right? Yeah. What we were saying about infanticide. If he protects his group and keeps other males out, he protects those babies and they survive. That's going to enhance his fitness. His being a big, big dude and a big guy that's protecting the group, that 
actually makes a difference. His babies survive, right? Likewise, let's now look at the uh, siamang, compare the siamang to the gibbon, right? And <clears throat> so in the, this shows uh, in the upper graph there this caring behavior by the male. For many months, he carries uh, the baby, basically. Now that relieves, as we were suggesting before, a huge energetic burden on the mom because she's not, you know, she can feed herself at the same time, she can also maybe provide better uh, quality breast milk, but the net effect actually is that, uh, that she can um, uh, 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 go into estrus again sooner and conceive again sooner. So, and that's what you see in this uh, bottom right hand graph here. Uh, if you look at the amount of time, this is again, primatologists have actually measured this nicely uh, for us. Um, if you look at the mean amount of time that a female carries her infant, this right? This would be like she carries it 70% of the time yeah. and the male carries meaning, it only 30% Meaning there's variation, the right, in, in terms of how much the male carries the infant in some of these sea among uh, populations and that's nice because then you can see does this variation in how much the female winds up carrying the infant how much does that affect her inner birth interval the 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 length of time between getting pregnant basically right or giving birth in this case it's called the IBI inner birth interval and you can see that the more she's stuck with the burden of having to carry the infant right the longer that interval between successive births the longer that inner birth interval. It takes her longer kind of to be able to have another baby. So, so what does that mean then in terms of father's fitness, this second factor? Well, think of it this way, right? That this is, a, this is a monogamous couple. All of these kids are his. If she can produce more of his kids because he's helping out by carrying them, that enhances his fitness. It's right. kind of similar to him uh, you know, providing more care for his kids and them surviving better. This is just another avenue by reducing her energetic burden, she can produce more of his kids. Right. So it's again uh, an enhanced, it's a fitness benefit for the father and it makes totally uh, good sense. In the gibbon it turns out, um, the female can do it alone basically because the offspring are a little smaller compared to the sea among offspring kind of like the orang situation, so she can manage it by herself. So there wouldn't be much benefit here for the male to step in and help. Mm -hmm. And right. so it nicely again explains these differences that we see even in closely related species uh, as to when males get involved when they make uh, an effort. So that second component is necessary. So we want to then take a minute and do this discussion. We have a few minutes here. I'll leave it open, you know, if you have to leave, I'll leave it open uh, so that you can complete it. Uh, based on the reading, the reading was Bales and Jericho, Fathering and Non-Human Primates. Discuss why the infant's weight in relation to the mother's weight, what's called the infant to mother weight ratio. Why is that important in our understanding of paternal care in primates? Why should the weight of the baby, what does that have anything to do with whether a male invests in paternal care. What do you think that connection is? That's what's explained in the reading. Can you think of what that is? Get out your book, think about it, use logic, and I will open up a discussion. So talk to each other, because you can figure it out together, too. So we're going to go around and make sure that you're discussing it. We should. They can talk about it here.
So knowing that you only have a few minutes, you know, please do discuss. Use this time to figure out what your response might be. We will leave this open. It'll be assigned like homework in Top Hat. It'll say homework. And we'll leave it open till 6 o'clock tonight, OK? So you can compose your answer and submit it until 6 o'clock tonight. There isn't much time right now, we understand, if you need to go to your next class. Uh, but discuss it now if you can, because you'll get good ideas.